you know, one of the things that I, I think is, I don't know that we'll ever know an answer. I don't know that we'll ever have an answer to the question, but I think one of the challenges of trying to reconcile all of these disparate data sources is it's all apples and oranges with respect to the metrics, right? It's you're comparing hours of exercise a week to mileage run to, you know, true measures of fitness like VO2 max. Uh, I guess the question is, and I've thought a lot about this, and I'd be very curious to your thoughts. If you could reverse engineer where you want your VO2 max to be when you're 90, what would, should it be? Because if you have a sense of what your VO2 max should be when you're 90, you kind of know what it needs to be when you're 80, 70, 60, blah, 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 all the way back. And, you know, at that point, it's not necessarily about how fast you want to run a mile, though you may say, look, when I'm 90, I still want to run a nine minute mile. I don't know. But it, it really starts to get into the activities of daily living and how much pain are you willing to tolerate to walk up two flights of stairs with your groceries? And, and I suspect, so I know for me, and I don't, I don't know for me, I hypothesize for me that when I'm 90, that the real risk is that I won't be able to get up out of a chair more than that I won't have the, the VO2 max. And, and there are, you know, people, they've, I don't know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there are thresholds of VO2 max below which they hypothesize that you can't, I, I can't remember if it's like 18 or not, you know, maybe it's nine or something like that, where it's like, at this point, you're, you've crossed the sort of mortality index where we think you're going to die in a few years because you can't do uh, activities of daily living. So there is some research into that. But for me, as just my personal, I, I, I can look at myself and say, you know what, Alex, you, you, far before your VO2 max is too low, you're going to be the guy who falls on the floor and can't get up. And so, you, you know, again, from a health perspective, that's why I said, you know, the next thing I, if I had, you know, magic motivation dust, it would be like, you need to put on some muscle mass. And for other people, it would be totally different. There are, there are people I know who, who don't necessarily exercise a lot, but who just ha have a lot more muscle mass than me. And it's like, you need to, uh, you know, make sure your aerobic fitness is, is, is taken care of. And maybe you don't need to worry as much as, as, as me about muscle mass. So there's, yeah, but I, I mean, I agree. You, you, you figure out where you want to be. And for all those different things, so I'm doing exactly what you said, except I'm doing it for muscle mass. And I'm like, ooh, this trajectory is not good. And, and, and of course, part of that's predicated on the idea that we know there's an inevitability of decline. So if you do nothing, you're going to lose X pounds of muscle per decade, on a, if you're lucky, with a tailwind. Um, if you train really hard, you might be able to reduce it to this amount of loss. And if you really go crazy, you might even be able to keep it flat. But you know, here's the scenario under which um, that occurs. What do you think is the, are, I mean, I assume there are pretty clear tables on what the decade by decade drop of aerob maximal aerobic output is. There are, I mean, the problem with the tables is that they, they, they draw a nice smooth line. You lose, I think it's 9% per decade or something like that is at least in the, once you get into your seventies, it, it gets steeper. Yeah. You, there's an inflection point. The the sort of revised thinking is that that's that works on a population level. But what actually happens is the decline is not that steep uh, for any individual. But what happens is you have certain events in your life. You you have you get an injury and you're you stop training for six months and then you're hosed. Yeah. So either you have reduced activity for six months or you have bed rest for a week, which can be disastrous, uh, and you lose. 7% in the course of a week and you only get 2% back. And so it's this punct punctuated decline. And so, that, I mean, that puts a lot of emphasis, that it sort of points to the idea of really taking care to avoid, to the, to the extent possible, obviously, to avoid these sorts of events because you can actually, in the absence of those, those events, the decline doesn't have to be that steep. You can, you can hang on probably better than people used to think. Can you say more about that? Because I, I don't think this point can be stressed enough. Um, realistically, how much aerobic capacity, maximal aerobic capacity can a person lose with a couple of weeks of inactivity? And what's the difference between being bedridden versus going on vacation to Europe where you're not quote unquote training, but you're still walking every day? Like neither of those is exercise per se, but one is active and one is complete inactivity. Bed rest is terrifying. Uh, th there's a guy named Luke Van Loon in, in the Netherlands who's he, his focus is, is muscle muscular strength, but he's done a bunch of bed rest studies. And he I, I saw him give a talk once, and he he had this great anecdote about, you know, they, they'd spent 
a whole bunch. It's really hard to get old people to put on muscle, right? But they just managed to finish this two and a half year study where they got, I can't remember, some fairly large number of septuagenarians, octogenarians to do strength training. And they put on like two and a half kilograms of muscle, which is a huge yeah. victory. And they were feeling really good about it. And then the results came in for their one week bed rest study. And they'd lost like 2.6 kilograms of muscle in one week. So it's like, they did this like Herculean effort to to shepherd these people through strength training for for a long period of time with full support. But man, whatever it is, you you know, grandma gets pneumonia and is in in hospital for for a week. Bam, she's lost a year of training or or, or you know whatever the case may be. So I I don't have the numbers at hand for V two max. I, I think it's like up to twenty, you know, 50, maybe ten to twenty percent in that range if you if you stop training for a month. It depends where you're starting though. Like yeah. it's a if you if you're if you're well trained for a short period of time, you'll lose it quickly. If you're if you haven't been training, then resting doesn't make any difference. And if you're well trained for a long, long period of time, then you have structural adaptations that are going to take a lot longer to disappear. So um, it, you know, it, there's no one number for every, anyone. Uh, and and the one thing I, I I would add is that this is not a recommendation that you should never take a break from exercise. That you should be obsessive and, and and train 365 days a year. Certainly, if you're training hard, like if you're if you're if you're training as a as a marathoner, say, man, it, you, you should take a, a week or two off. And off doesn't mean bed rest. It means play a couple games of tennis, go for walks, chill out, go for some bike rides or whatever. But uh, you, so you shouldn't be terrified of of like missing a day. Yep. But you should be terrified of bed rest and of and of totally. I mean, Luke Van Loon, one of the things he said is like, if you're on bed rest, you, you know, hospitals should be forcing you, if you're at all possible, to walk down the hallway to get your meal. Even just walking down the hallway is infinitely better hmm. than not moving at all. 